Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Robin, I'm so excited because another one of, I mean, we have guests on that are just like the best in their field and also they're my buddies that I love. And so I am so excited because we have my buddy, Michelle Wiener Davis on today. Michelle is like such a badass in what she talks about. She doesn't mince words. She talks about divorce. She is the divorce busting person. If you've ever heard of divorce busting, that's Michelle. She was on Oprah. She is a specialist in infidelity. She has a TED Talk that has been viewed, I don't know, Michelle, how many millions of times now? Well, I think it's over 9 million at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 9 million. Yeah. So we are so excited to have you on. It's so nice to see you too. The people listening can't see you, but I can see you and it's delightful to see you. And I'm so glad you're here. What else do you want to say about yourself? Well, you know, in terms of our topic today, and Lynn, why don't you tell them what the topic is? Well, one of the things that we really want you to talk about is what happens when parents don't invest in their relationship and they put the kids first what's the impact on marriages and relationships? And that is your bailiwick because you know all about how things go wrong. And then we're also going to talk about how to make sure they don't go wrong. There are a number of reasons I know all about this. The first two are personal and the third one is uh, professional. So the first one is that my husband and I have been together for 50 years, which is incredible. It's hard to believe. And we have two children who are now adult children. And so we could have a bird's eye view of what the impact that it has on relationships to have kids. And now that my own kids are adults and they have kids of their own, I have a bird's eye view of what happens in their families. In particular, I was just thinking about my son, who he and his wife have a three-year-old and two nine-month-old <laughs> identical twins. Their house is <laughs> is like a daycare center. It does take a toll. It certainly takes a toll. But in terms of uh, professionally, I don't, Lynn, even though you and I have known each other for a while, I don't think you know this, that although I'm considered sort of the go-to person when it comes to marriages teetering on the brink of divorce, prior to specializing in work with couples, I worked for nine years at a social service agency doing family therapy. That was my thing, working with kids and their parents and their families. That educated me a whole lot. But truly, truly, the most important lessons I've learned about the impact on marriage of kids is in my uh, nearly four decades of specializing in work with couples who are 911 couples, oftentimes where one person wants in and one person wants out, and trying to help these couples find some solutions and some ways to keep their marriages and families together. And it's so interesting to me that one of the primary patterns that I've seen in couples who are really struggling is this tendency that people have to really focus on the kids at the expense of their own relationship. In fact, in our country, although the divorce, the statistics about divorce that has leveled off, there is only one group of people where divorce is actually on the increase. And it's in this group that's referred to as gray divorce. People who have been married sometimes for 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years. And what they've done over the course of their marriage they focused on the kids. Oftentimes, one partner has done that more than the other, but they've grown apart. And guess what happens if you do the parenting thing right? Kids leave home, and then they look at each other, notice that they are complete strangers. And one, sometimes both partners ask themselves, is this the way that I want to spend the rest of my life? And unfortunately, sometimes people say no. I know firsthand 
seeing up close and personal what can happen in terms of marriages really being in trouble when kids are the priority. That's so exciting to talk about this today, Michelle. And I have a question for you. You use this phrase, 911 couples. So clearly these are couples in a place of emergency. What are all of the ways in which you provide a service or help to those couples knowing that they are sort of at the last stage before a breakup? It's a great question, Robin. First of all, the format that I use to work with these couples is really different than what many of your listeners might think about when they think about therapy, your hourly sessions. What I've discovered over the course of my career, especially with these couples who have pretty challenging issues that have been longstanding, is that hourly sessions, they're very challenging in terms of getting anything accomplished. Because what happens with a lot of people, first of all, is they wait until the last five or 10 minutes to tell you what is really going on. And then the hour is over. Oftentimes, when I worked that way, it left people sort of in the throes of discussing the problem, discussing really difficult emotions, and then they had to leave and they, the bad feelings went with them when they left. I mean, then they had a week, maybe two, to think about what we had talked about and it made things worse rather than better. It was difficult to get any traction. And so I started to experiment with having longer sessions. First, I decided to have an all-day session, all day meaning nine to four, with a break for lunch. And I wasn't sure whether I would actually know what to do to fill up that time, but what I discovered pretty quickly, especially with these couples, because either they hadn't gotten help or if they had gotten help, it wasn't very effective. They had so many layers of the onion to unpeel I very quickly discovered that one day wasn't enough, and now I do exclusively two-day intensives with couples. Part of what I have discovered, and this is just my philosophy, so often people feel that they need to end their relationships or end their marriages because they are incompatible. What I've noticed is that most of the problems that couples are having when they're considering divorce are resolvable. And it isn't about their having irreconcilable differences. It, it truly is what I consider to be a skill deficit. They just don't know how to work through the differences that they have. And that's one of the things that I do with couples. It's very pragmatic. It's very optimistic and very positive. And people discover that, you know, one of the reasons they've gotten stuck over the years, as I said, it, it's a skill deficit. And when they learn new information, they're able to handle their own challenges in new ways. And surprisingly, especially to those who are reticent to think that change is possible, surprisingly, many people find themselves reigniting those really warm, loving feelings that they had in the beginning of their relationship. We're going to take a break and we'll come right back and unpack all of these incredible skills. There's always one friend in the group that's really good at treating herself. I personally hope it's you. As you've taught me, maybe you opt for that extra legroom seat on the airplane. So when you treat yourself to top options, why settle when you're finding a doctor? Because it is your health. Yeah, enter ZocDoc. That's the place where you can find and book tens of thousands of top tier doctors, all with verified patient reviews. When it comes to your medical care, it's not the time to settle. Check out ZocDoc. It's the place where you can find and book doctors that will make you feel comfortable, listen to you, and prioritize your health. All these docs have verified reviews from actual real patients, and the typical wait time to see a doctor based on ZocDoc is between just 24 and 72 hours. That's it. You can even score some same-day appointments. ZocDoc is a free app. It's a website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. I use this to find a specialist for my kid. It works. Go to ZocDoc.com slash Fluster and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Fluster. ZocDoc.com slash Fluster. This episode is brought to you by Trumetta. 
It's a premium supplement company based out of California that strives to make self-care easy. One of their great products is mushroom coffee. It is a must for your morning routine, and it tastes delicious. It has no mushroom aftertaste, only the benefits that mushrooms bring. And this organic premium coffee blend has lion's mane mushroom for productivity, reishi mushroom for immune support, cordyceps to boost your energy, and of course, caffeine to give you the kick that you need every day. Yeah, we need that caffeine. So start your your 2024 healthier with True Meta Mushroom Coffee and see for yourself how it helps you to focus so you can get stuff done. You'll feel an uptake in your productivity every time you drink it. Trumetta offers their best deal to Fluster Clucks fans. You'll get a free electric mixer and 40% off the coffee plus free shipping in the U.S. So go right now to trumetta.com slash fluster to fuel your productivity and creativity with some delicious mushroom coffee. That's T-R-U-M-E-T-A dot com slash fluster. Some New Year's resolutions are destined to fail, like waking up at 5 a.m. every morning and doing a morning jog before you wake the kids. So lucky for you, I have an easy resolution that we can all make and it will make your life easier. It'll be kinder to our planet and transform the way you do laundry in 2024. And that is switching to Earth Breeze. I know what you're thinking. Laundry isn't very fun. Buying a huge heavy plastic jug and measuring it out just the right amount of detergent while getting goo all over the place it's infuriating, but thankfully, EarthBreeze heard our cries, and now Echo Sheets are here to change the game. Unlike liquid powder or capsule detergent, EarthBreeze looks like a dryer sheet, but it's ultra concentrated laundry detergent. It couldn't be easier. Just throw a sheet in your laundry and watch it dissolve in any wash cycle, hot or cold. I keep a few in a Ziploc bag in my suitcase, so I have laundry detergent whenever I would need it. EarthBreeze fights everyday stains and odors, giving you an amazing clean every time. And there's no measuring, no mess, and best of all, no wasteful plastic. Jug. I love that EarthBreeze is dermatologically tested, hypoallergenic, and free from bleaches and dyes. So it's perfect for every load I have, from bedding to towels. And the best part is that you'll never run out of detergent again, thanks to EarthBreeze flexible subscription that you can adjust, pause, or cancel at any time with no hidden fees or penalties. And you save a whopping 40% when you subscribe. And shipping's always free. So Echo Sheets are packaged in a slim cardboard envelope that saves a ton of space. Switching to EarthBreeze won't only make laundry day easier for you, but it will also be easier on the planet. Let's make plastic jugs a thing of the past. And if EarthBreeze doesn't end up being the 2024 update of your dreams, you don't even have to return it. Just let them know it's not for you and you'll get a full refund with no questions asked. So right now, Fluster Cluckers, get started with EarthBreeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off your subscription. Okay, we're back. Okay, so Robin, now you know why I love Michelle. I hear her say skill building and I'm like, wee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Robin has been trained up in the idea of skill building. It's just pragmatic and skill building and optimism and giving people information. Like I think that Michelle and I both think that you're asking if I'm asking a family, she's asking a couple, what do you do about this? That we're waiting for the, I don't know. We're waiting for them to look at you like, what are you talking about? Because that's right where you dive in, Michelle, right? You go right after those myths and right after the things that people have been told that you want to dispel. So tell us some of the most consistent and also powerful myths that people bring in to your intensives. Well, I think one of them is that their spouses should just know what they need and they want. And after they've been together for so long, they shouldn't have to tell their spouse what their needs are. And it, is, it creates a lot of problems to be thinking like that. It's wonderful if someone can anticipate what the other person wants. And if that happens, it's icing on the cake. But when it doesn't happen, the person who's feeling shortchanged makes up stories about why it's not happening. And I always ask couples, okay, what's the story you tell yourself about what just happened? And it's incredible how often the theories we have about our partner's behavior or lack of actions, it's negative. 
and we believe our own stories. And so I sort of punch holes into this mythical thinking because I truly believe and call me a psychotic optimist that most of the time people want to get things right. And when they don't, it's because they don't really know how to hit the mark. And so I teach people about the importance of being clear about what they need. I'll give you an example that oh, has good. to do with sex. Um, <laughs> I, and this is a true example. I'm not making it up, even though you might think I am. I had a couple not long ago. They were having difficulty in their sex life. And the wife said, you know, I don't even like the way my husband initiates sex. And so I said, well, what is it that you would prefer that he do instead? Or what would be sexy to you? And she said to me, you know, when we're sitting near each other, he just comes over and he gropes my body. I think it's so rude. I want him to use his words. I want him to say to me, are you in the mood? Do you want to fool around? Is now a good time? But he doesn't. He just grabs me and I don't like it at all. And so I thought that was great because she was clear and he took mental notes of what to do differently. The next week, and I mean literally the next week, I had a different couple and the wife said exactly the same thing. She said, Michelle, I don't like the way my husband initiates sex. And I said, well, what would you prefer that he do? What would be sexy to you? And she said, he always asks me if I'm in the mood or not. That is not sexy. I want him to grab me and be passionate. And I thought, I have the weirdest job in the world, right? If there were a Martian standing in the room trying to figure out how do humans initiate sex, the Martian would be pretty confused. That's why it is so important to spell out in concrete, observable, action-oriented terms what you mean when you're telling your spouse what you need. It doesn't mean anything to say, I need more attention, I need more affection, I need more respect, because what that means to you is different than what it means to your spouse or to me or to anybody else for that matter. It may seem a little unromantic to have to spell things out, but the benefit of doing so is where the romance begins. That's an example. I think a lot of couples, like when you have that conversation, can be more effective than another. Just like Lynn has the advice of not trying to do the work with your kid when they're having a meltdown, I think that a couple having an alone time on their back porch or at a restaurant over a meal, asking those basic questions. What do you think is the sexiest way to initiate sex? What are the things that you like the most? What physical affection do I show you that makes you feel the most loved versus like right in the moment? Then it, there's like emotion attached. And think of what it's like to go see Michelle and that you're sitting there with your partner. You're trying to save your marriage and she guides you through all of these conversations that you need to have. Talk about optimistic. Talk about hopeful, right? She's saying, let's have a conversation. And she walks couples through the conversations that they need to have. Absolutely. And Robin, I think you, you hit on a couple of important points there. One is timing. I think when you have those conversations is super important. And I always uh, coach couples to ask their partner if now's a good time to have an important conversation. I think that's number one. There's another very important concept that I teach couples. I ask them, you know, when they start to tell me what they're unhappy about or how they felt disappointed in their marriage, I ask them, when that happened, what did you do? How did you handle it? And when they share it with me, I say, and was that helpful? Did you get the response that you were hoping for? And typically they'll say no. And I say, well, when that didn't work, what did you do next? And they'll often give me something else that they've done. But here's what generally happens. After a few times of doing something, they give up. They just assume it's not going to happen. Instead of thinking about the fact that it was time for them to try something entirely different. Typically, what people do to solve a problem when it's not working, instead of telling themselves, you know, that didn't work, I have to try something different, what they do is they just do more of what hasn't been working, only they do it a little bit harder, a little bit more emphatically. And you know that there's that saying that insanity has been defined as doing the same old thing and expecting different results. But here's the bad news. 
when you continue over time to do the same old thing, to have the same old fight, to have the same old script that you have with your spouse, it does yield different results. It makes your relationship worse because people tend to escalate and they tend to get hopeless. And so one of the novel ideas I teach people who have been unhappy in their marriage is that they haven't really experimented and been more creative in ways to get through to their spouse. And along the lines of skill building, if they can't think of ideas to try that are different, I help them with that so that they can get through their spouse who hasn't been listening. Let's bring parenting into this equation because as you are outlining the types of conversations that you have with couples and the skills that are missing from their communication and their dynamic, and then they want to throw at you, well, we've put the needs of our kids first. This is ultimately emotional management. Is it fair to say that someone could really effectively put the needs of their kids and their parenting first and show up in all of these glorious ways, but yet still miss these skills as a couple? Aren't these skills kind of overarching in all of your relationships? Well, what tends to happen, Robin, is that people generally don't say we put the needs of our kids first. It's sort of like they don't even realize that they've been doing it. It's sort of like I've heard that saying about fish not really knowing what water is because they're immersed in it. That's their life. And that's what happens with parents. I'll give you a typical scenario, and it is stereotypical, so there are, of course, are exceptions to this, but very often when a couple has a baby, even honestly, if it's a two-career family, women tend to really invest in keeping this little thing alive in ways that sometimes dads don't do. Sometimes moms get resentful that dads aren't participating more, and they feel that They have to do it. They have to put this energy into the kid. Very often, dads feel left out. You know, they had their wife's attention for a very long time, and all of a sudden, there's this third person on the scene. And when they feel left out of that loop, they often focus on other things, like they invest themselves more in work or playing golf or being away from home. And when moms see that their husbands are less invested, they're not spending time with them, they're not helping out, they get really upset and they feel disconnected. And of course, they then take all of their emotional needs and focus on the kid and the kid becomes, you know, more the center of their lives. What also tends to happen at this point, because their lives are so separate, is very often sexual intimacy goes right out the door, in part because so often, again, this is stereotypical, but women often need to feel close and connected emotionally before they're interested in investing themselves physically. And men, on the other hand, often need to feel close and connected physically before they invest emotionally. And in this case, emotionally might mean being present, you know, with his wife and with his kid and really asking her about her day or being the one to suggest a date night. None of that stuff is happening. And this is arbitrary where I pick the starting point because it's circular in nature, but the more he's out of the home and out of her life and out of, he's not really present, the less she wants to be close to him physically and the less physicality they have in their relationship, the more he disappears. And this happens and then it's, It gets even worse as you add children into the family until finally really leading separate lives in a lot of ways. Some people talk about feeling like they're strangers to one another, and each person blames the other for not being there. And sometimes, by the way, that's not the only dynamic. Sometimes both spouses are making the kids the most important variable in their lives. They're making sure that they're in the best schools. They're making sure they have the best after-school classes. They're running them all ragged all over the place to their friend's house, to whatever sports that they're in. 
Sometimes when I ask people, when was the last time you had a date night, just the two of you, and I see sort of a glazed over look in their eyes and they come up with the fact that they took their kids (laughs) to a soccer game. It's true. It happens. I always tell couples, and I say this sort of at risk of offending them sometimes, when they have devoted themselves, they adore their kids. I say to them, you know, the very best thing you can do for your kids is to put your marriage first. And what this means is that even if you have busy careers, have date nights, plan separate time away from your kids, make it a priority to have your private time, even if they can't go over to a friend's house, don't let them interrupt your conversations all the time. Sometimes make your bedroom a safe zone just for the two of you. When parents really put kids front and center, it's not because they're being bad parents. They're very loving people. Sometimes they grew up in families where they felt neglected and they want to do it differently than their parents. Sometimes they see everybody else prioritizing the kids and they feel guilty when they don't. Sometimes they tell me we can't find babysitters or we don't trust anybody else with our kids. Their kids aren't going to die. You know, kids usually love the babysitters people get for them. It's a matter of educating people about you simply cannot put your marriages on the back burner and take it for granted that you will be there and that your relationship will be healthy when the kids leave home because it, it won't. When you're talking to these couples in this state, people tend to put the efforts that are easiest on them. It's so easy to not get invested in the home and focus on your work life if things are challenging there or to focus on the kids and ignore your spouse. But you're missing the point of like the really difficult karmic learning of your life is to be married to somebody and to be partnered with somebody where they keep challenging you and you keep challenging them. But that's really hard work that people don't even know how to start sometimes, right? And and that's true. And it's a separate issue because here's, I think, a really important point. People really need to internalize that having, creating, maintaining a loving relationship isn't just good for you. It's not a selfish act. Kids learn about relationships, not through what you tell them, but through what they see. And if you don't prioritize your relationship, if you're never physically affectionate in front of your kids, if you don't fight and then make up to to show kids that part of being in a relationship is having conflict, but also resolving it. If you don't show your kids that your favorite person is your spouse, how will they ever learn it? They don't learn it. So it isn't just because you're taking care of your own adult needs to put your marriage first. It's because you want to model for your kids that that is an an incredibly important thing to do. And the other thing, too, you're modeling for your kids is that they are not always the center of the universe, which is a really important thing for kids to experience, that you have relationships. It could be friendships. It could be your partner, of course. But when kids get the message over and over again that their needs come first all the time, they go into the world believing that their needs come first all the time. And that doesn't make for a good setup for future relationships. Absolutely. And it's unrealistic because not everybody's going to do that for them as they get older, (laughs) Right. right? It's like a harsh reality out there to learn, you know, that you have to share. I mean, I know some young moms who anytime their kids are around, they will never be on the phone. You know, they allow their kids to interrupt them all the time. Everything is focused on the kid first. And I just think it's unrealistic. Michelle, I know so many of our listeners are either personally feeling that this is speaking to them or to other couples that are close to them. So when we come back, let's talk about, okay, now what? Hey, Lynn, wouldn't you say that it's 
almost as important to raise financially literate kids as it is emotionally intelligent kids? Of course, because I'm always talking about the big skills that we want our kids to have, decision-making, autonomy, being able to step in the world independently, and starting early, giving kids the opportunity to learn how to manage their money and make good financial decisions. It's a great idea. So we have a Lifesaver recommendation you need to check out called Greenlight. Greenlight's a debit card and money app made for families, and it gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy, and it gives parents a peace of mind. Yeah, you can do things like send instant money transfers. You can automate allowance. You can also keep an eye on your kids' spending with real-time notifications. Kids can begin their journey toward financial autonomy, and you know how I love autonomy, by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. The app includes a chores feature where you can set up recurring or one-time chores customized to your family's needs, and you can reward kids for a job well done. And this is a game changer because otherwise, in the old days, We would ask them to do the chores. We would try and track it. Maybe they didn't always get paid for what they had done. Then there was a disagreement about, did you pay me for this or that? And then like the love of chores went away really fast. It's about consistency and it's about helping parents teach their kids these valuable skills that set them up for success in the future. So 6 million parents and kids are learning about money on Greenlight. It's the easy, convenient way to get kids on the right financial path. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash fluster. That's greenlight.com slash fluster to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash fluster. Picture that thing that you've always wanted to learn and now... Picture learning it from the person who's literally the best at it in the world. That's what you get with Masterclass. This year, learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass. And don't just talk about improving. Masterclass helps you actually do it. Masterclass offers over 180 world-class instructors, and you've heard all their names. So whether you want to master a negotiation with Chris Voss, think like a boss like Martha Stewart, or learn about comedy writing from David Sedaris, Masterclass has you covered. With Masterclass, you get unlimited access to intimate one-on-one classes with the world's best. I've learned so much from Masterclass, and you will too. There are over 200 classes to pick from with new classes added every month. There are over 200 classes to pick from with new classes added every month, like learning mindfulness from the one and only John Kabat-Zinn. Every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So there's no risk. And right now, Fluster Clucks listeners will get an additional 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash fluster. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash fluster. Masterclass.com slash fluster. Okay, so now back to the show. All right, so Michelle, let's talk skills. Let's talk tips. If you've got people who are really looking to spend more time together and to reconnect, perhaps their marriage has felt fine, but not great. Can you give us some really good, solid advice about how to do that? Yes, absolutely. I know that you know many of your listeners are familiar with the book, The Five Love Languages. And I love that book, and I'll explain why in a minute. But I always think about this in terms of this concept that I developed called real giving. I think people tend to give to one another or show love to one another in the way they like to receive. But that is not real giving. Real giving is when you give to your partner the things your partner really wants and needs, whether you understand it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, is really irrelevant. You do it because loving relationships, healthy relationships are built on this mutual caretaking. And I often give people an example of in my own life about, you know, when we think about what makes us feel loved, and I think that's getting at what you're asking, Lynn, about doing the things that make each other feel loved and connected. When the way we feel loved has a lot to do, of course, with 
things that happened over the course of our childhood that, that when we felt loved, when there were certain behaviors and patterns and we felt loved, we connected the dots and to us that became love. And in my world, I was extremely close to my mom. And one of the things my mom always did is she was very tuned in to me when I was a kid, when I was an adult, she could sense when something wasn't right. And what she would do as a, as a result is she would ask me about my feelings. She would talk to me about my feelings. And I felt seen and heard and cared for. As an example, if I came home from school as a little kid and not something had happened, she knew it. And she'd come up to me and say, are you okay? Did something happen at school? Did you get into a fight with a friend and so forth? And I took this lesson of love into the early years of my marriage with my husband, Jim, who's a kind of a real estate developer, type A personality, hard driving, Mr. Macho in a lot of ways. And when he would come home from work and I would see something happened in his day that wasn't so positive, I would show love to him in the way it was shown to me, which is to say, I would go and say, are you okay? Did something happen at work? Did one of your deals fall through? Did the architect screw up? And so on and so forth. And this gift of love that I was giving to him was returned unopened because he didn't look at it as an act of love or a gift at all. He was actually very annoyed at me. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand how he could be so mad when I'm being so kind and so loving. And finally, I figured out because he told me, you know, Michelle, it may work for you when you're upset about something to talk about it. But the very last thing I ever want to do at the end of a bad day is to rehash it. And so I figured out that if I want to give to Jim, my husband, in the way that he likes to receive is that when I see him hurting or mulling something over, I have to zip it leave the room and give him space, which by the way, defies every single bone in my body. I consider it an <laughs> unnatural act. But because we're wired differently, that's what we have to do. We have to really think about what does my partner need, not what do I need? And when I make suggestions to couples, and if either one of them ever says to me, but Michelle, that feels like an unnatural act. I go, cool, because <laughs> it probably means they're stepping outside their own comfort zone to do what works for the other person. When you do that for Jim, as you learned what he wanted, say he comes home now and you can tell he needs his space. Do you acknowledge that in any way and say, you know what, I'm going to lovingly give you space right now and I look forward to seeing you later? Or would that even annoy him and you don't say anything at all? The word lovingly would annoy him. <laughs> <laughs> Words at that point are annoying. <laughs> but you know what, Robin, that's a perfect segue because I think you asked the question, maybe you're more word-oriented like me. My husband doesn't need those words. He just needs me to leave and or to not talk to him about what's going on with him. I, he doesn't need an explanation. Well, the other thing I was just thinking of is that because he likes to be left alone, if you just aren't home, when he, you know, if you just leave, but you're not telling him you're doing that because you're acknowledging that's what he needs, I mean, you could just like get on a plate and go somewhere and then he'd be like, wow, my wife's the best. <laughs> so what's the way of sort of acknowledging you are doing something for him or is that like not part of it? You know, it really is me when I sense that he's ruminating about something and his way of self-soothing is to be by himself. I just need to, I don't have to get on a plane, but I do need to give him space. And it's understood. But you know, people who are listening, there's some people, for example, when they're upset, they want their spouse to ask, are you okay? Is there something you want to talk about? And they're probably often married to someone who more like my husband, who just wants to be left alone. Where people really get screwed up is if I need you to say to me, are you okay? Do you want to talk about something? But my partner assumes that you want to be left alone. That's where people get screwed up is when you are projecting what you need onto the other person and not really thinking about their internal workings and what really works for them. 
And that's really what that whole book, The Five Love Languages, is based on. For, you know, listeners who are not familiar with it, what I love about the book is that Gary Chapman has distilled down to five different ways that people feel loved. I think it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's very, very useful. You know, some people feel loved when their partners affirm them verbally. Some people feel loved when their partners are spending quality time with them. Some people feel loved when there's a lot of physical touch, whether it's sex or affectionate touch. Some people feel loved when their partners do what's referred to as acts of service, which means supporting a family, taking care of kids, doing what needs to be done around a house. There are those deeds, those kind deeds of bringing your spouse a cup of coffee or heating the car up so your spouse gets into a nice warm car on a wintry day like today. And finally, material gifts is the last love language, and it is what you might imagine where If you put energy into thinking about what would this person really want and you make it or you buy it and you give it to them, it makes their heart sore. And the mistake that people make over and over again, if I'm a person who needs words of affirmation, I give my spouse words of affirmation. They don't really want compliments. They don't really care about it. And then you don't understand why they're so ungrateful. The point of that is when you start to think about maybe we have prioritized our kids too much, maybe we need to focus on our own relationship, figure out what it takes to make your spouse feel loved, not what it takes to make you feel loved, and begin to do those things. And that works for both people. And the beauty of all of this, by the way, and it usually works this way, when you get good at figuring out your spouse's love language and you speak it, there's usually reciprocity. And so it's not just a selfless act showing love, you tend to get it back. And I think that sometimes people make the same mistake with their kids too, right? So your kids have ways of, they want you to parent and show love and you do it the way you think that they should. So you've got a kid who really just wants your time and attention, but you buy them stuff. Or you've got a child that really wants to talk about what's going on, but you're not good at having those conversations, right? So the same thing gets played out in those parent-child relationships too. Absolutely. A kid comes home from school and they're upset. I mean, I just had this situation, right? The kid gets in the car and the mom's pretty anxious and the kid gets in the car and the mom says, how was your day? Tell me about your day. And then by the time she says, by the time we get home, my kid is crying and so upset and all I was trying to do was help. And I said, well, how about when you get in the car, why don't you just say to them, it's so good to see you and then be quiet. And when they want to start talking to you about it, they'll start talking to you about it. But it's that misfire, isn't it? Of this feels good to me. So it must feel good to you too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I really think, and it's not just spouses and it's not just parent and kids, it's coworkers, it's friends, it's extended family. People need to make more of an effort to figure out the internal map of those around us as opposed to assuming everybody is like us and behaving in that way. I mean, to me, that's generosity. That's love to really try to put yourself into someone else's shoes, even if you don't understand why they feel that way. I mean, the truth is that example that I gave you about my husband who comes home, looks distraught, and doesn't want to talk about it. I was in my 20s when that started to happen. I thought there was something emotionally wrong with him that he didn't want to talk about what was going on with him. I thought he was like his development had been thwarted or something. (laughs) And I finally realized, no, it's just because we're different and different isn't bad. And really that's the couples need to understand they can be completely different and they can both be right. And the key is in figuring how do you incorporate your differences? You know, the research shows the people who are in long-term happy marriages are no more similar to one another than those who divorce. But there is at least one thing that's different about people who make it over the long haul and are happy. They learn how to deal with their differences. So Michelle, I'd love to end on a hopeful note. So obviously you are very effective working with couples in an all day. And I think Lynn and I would love talking to you all day about this topic. It would be very easy, but things can really turn around 
So for listeners who recognize that they might be in some of these patterns, what is your message of optimism for them? You know, I sometimes people ask, especially when I do training that I've done for couples or training that I've done for other mental health professionals, Michelle, you sound so optimistic, but what are those kinds of situations that would lead you to feel they're not going to make it or they can't make it? And all I can tell you is that there are no particular situations or interactions or problems, or even if problems have lasted a long time, that ever makes me think or say your marriage is dead on arrival. I think that hopelessness is the real cancer in marriage. And if you are feeling stuck, if you reach out to a therapist who tells you that, you know, there's no point in going on because you have irreconcilable differences, then you need to find somebody else. Because part of my psychotic optimism is that there are solutions to most problems. Clearly, there are some marriages that do end, that need to end. But there are so many unnecessary divorces, I think. And reach out to someone for whom psychotic optimism is part of the way they see the world as well. It's on their business card. Psychotic optimist. It's a communicable disease. (laughs) (laughs) Optimism is contagious. That's right. I was thinking uh, when I was asking if you said to your husband, Jim, I'm lovingly giving you space right now, I realized that's like the worst thing you could do because it would be the equivalent of the person who's, I'm emptying the dishwasher for you right now. (laughs) I'm taking out the trash for you right now, which is, I think there's actually some funny Instagram reels on that. You do not want your partner (laughs) announcing all of their acts of service. I am now engaging in your love language, just so you know. I hope you notice that I am currently loving in your love language. Yeah. The thing, Michelle, that is so important, I think, about the work that you do is that it is so pragmatic. And you're basically saying a lot of these people get into these situations because they don't know what else to do. They keep trying to do the same thing over and over again. They keep doing more of what's not working. And I think that one of the key words that you use when you're talking to couples is creativity, that it really is about thinking about something in a different way rather than getting stuck in your own stories. Those stories that we tell, oh my gosh, right? We get stuck in our own stories. We believe our own stuff. I love the word creativity when we're talking about making your relationship stronger. Absolutely. And I guess one more thing that I want to say, sometimes I think people who are listening will think it's been so long since we've had a date night, or I don't even know what we would talk about at this point. The deal is, if you've been distant, it will feel awkward at first. Push through it. The awkwardness is not a sign that you shouldn't do it. The awkwardness is a sign that you need to keep doing it until you get to the point where it feels natural and fun and you're so glad that you are doing it. Yeah. I'll tell you this one funny story. So I used to rent an office space with this woman who was also a social worker like me. And she was probably in her mid forties, although I don't know how old I thought she was, but looking back at it now, like she was probably in her mid forties and I was fairly newly married. I was in my first private practice. She had another office. She was lovely. And I remember this so clearly. She went on a trip with her husband to Europe and she came back and I'd been married for like two years. She came back and I said, how was your trip? And she said, oh, it was amazing. She said, I fell in love with my husband all over again. And I remember thinking, I don't know what the heck she's talking about. (laughs) 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 What? What do you mean? Now I get it. Yeah. 40 years in, because I've known my husband for 40 years. So it is just a constant, like you say, a constant maintenance and a constant checking in. We use the expression weeding the garden. Weeding the garden. That's what we always say. Let's weed the garden. I thought that was a sex euphemism, Robin. (laughs) It's both. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm about to make a, a little pun, but I won't. You know, the other thing I guess I should say is that as much as you've heard me say today, the, the most important thing that you can do for your kids is to put your marriage first. Kids really are the primary reason couples who are seriously considering divorce are sitting in my room. 
And I value that. And I tell people, you know, sometimes people will say things like, I mean, if it weren't for my kids, I wouldn't be here. As if to say, I'm not really in love with this person, and this is just not a great reason. And actually, there's some therapists who tell people that that's not a good reason. I, on the other hand, say, that's fantastic. Where in your life did you learn about the importance of family and making things work? Because I think that's fantastic. And your kids are pretty fortunate to have you as parents, given that you care so much about them. So kids are super important and they really do make marriage rich. Yeah. That's a wonderful, wonderful reframing of, I think, something that people have heard a lot. Oh, you know, we're just staying together for the kids. And you're saying, yeah, that's a really good reason. It's a really good reason to be sitting in your office trying to work through really difficult things. Okay. So tell us again, like I want, you have so many great resources. So tell us about your books. Give me the name of that TED Talk specifically so people can watch it because it's really good. We'll put it in the show notes too. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes too, but give us your list. So the TEDx Talk is The Sex Starved Marriage, my most recent book that, you know, and, and actually it's people who read this book and that's the reason they get to me these days. It's Healing from Infidelity. And Divorce Busting and Divorce Remedy. And there's also a book called The Sex Star Marriage. And believe it or not, there's a book called The Sex Star Wife. And the reason I say believe it or not is everybody thinks when they think about there being one highly sex partner and one low desire spouse, they always think about the guy who's chasing his wife around the living room. But the truth is there are many, many, many women who are feeling really disconnected from their husbands because it's their husbands who aren't interested in sex. And these women really struggle because when they hang out with their friends, all they ever hear about are high, highly sexed husbands. And so they think there's something wrong with them and there is nothing wrong with them. And it's good for people to know that that's a stereotype that doesn't always fit. Yeah. Well, I am so glad that you decided or that you agreed to come on our podcast, Michelle. You have offered perspectives that I think are eye-opening to people listening. And I know, I mean, your work is just so amazing and you're so amazing. Yeah. Let me just say this. Michelle and I are in a field where there are a lot of guys that sort of speak and that kind of stuff. And some of the most affirming and fun and satisfying conversations I've had is when I've been with Michelle and we're just like swapping stories and talking about how to be successful business women and our therapy practices. But she is such an incredible, helpful, wonderful role model to me. And I so appreciate you being in my life. Well, I ditto for you, Lynn. And I think you've heard me tell the story about how I like to listen to workshops at these big conferences that I go to. And one day I'm walking in the mountains and I have my earbuds in and I hear this woman named Lynn Lyons talking about anxiety. And I'm thinking, who is this person? Not only is she smart and she's so good, but I laughed all the way through the mountains. <laughs> and I said, I've got to find her. And I'm so glad I reached out. And it's a mutual admiration society for sure. Yes, I'm so grateful for you. Thanks for the invitation. And thank you, Robin. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. <laughs>